Hi, and welcome to Artistic Adventures. My name's Holly, and I'm one of the youth librarians at BB Library, and welcome, it's nice to see you. So today, our artist is Andy Warhol, and he's an artist that I think I've known my entire life. Um, he was somebody who was, um, I didn't know him as an artist. He was just a famous person, and was somebody who was always around with a lot of celebrities, and somebody who I thought was very strange looking. In fact, here's a, a picture of how I think of him, or how I remember him. I associated him with the, the New York City, kind of the party scene, and that he was, you know, with parties and kind of weird movies and things like that. So here, here's a, another, here's a picture of him, and this, this kind of is how I thought of him also. And in this picture, he's um, at a party with very famous people that are not so famous anymore. But Jerry Hall is next to him. And she was, um, I don't know if he was the wife or the girlfriend at that point, of um, the lead singer of the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger. And also Debbie Harry's on his other side. She was the lead singer of a rock group called uh, Blondie. And next to her is Truman Capote, who was um, also kind of a kind of a big name celebrity at those days. He was a writer. Uh, and on the far end is Paloma Picasso, who is a fashion designer and happens to be the wife of the artist Pablo Picasso, the wife, I'm sorry, the daughter of the, of the artist Pablo Picasso. So he was always out with big names. Um, we saw, actually saw him in a couple of the books. I kind of, kind of pointed to him, but he didn't, wouldn't have meant anything. But when we read the book on um, Yayoi Kusama, there was a picture of her at like in a big gallery opening, and there he was, always recognizable by the wigs that he wore. And we also saw him in the Keith Haring book at an, at an opening of his. So he was somebody who was always there, always around. Um, he liked being with, with celebrities and really liked the idea of glamor and fame, and it was very important to him. In fact, one quote that people will say that it's something in the future Everyone will be famous for 15 minutes is a quote that from him. So when I first saw his artwork and realized that he was an artist, probably it wasn't even until I was in high school, and that was um, his drawing of the Campbell soup cans. And I'll put up that picture. And when I saw it, I thought, you know, that it just looks like he's photocopied a lot of pictures of Campbell soup cans. And I don't know, I didn't think of it as art. And then I saw um, his picture of um, Marilyn Monroe, who was a very glamorous and famous star. And I thought, well, it's just like he took a photograph of her and just copied it. I discounted it, saying that it was a copy, not really art. But, you know, anybody that had a photocopier could do the same thing that, that he just did. But again, like I say with a lot of modern art, they didn't think of it, he thought of it. But then, um, years later, I went to an exhibit of his artwork and I was totally blown away. When I got up close and saw what he had done in painting all those cans, it wasn't photocopies, he painted all of them. It was amazing. And um, I, I really, it was like, he is a superb artist, he's really good and so innovative. So um, he was part of a group of, that became known in the 1960s as pop artists. And what a pop artist is, is someone that used popular culture and uh, celebrities, things like commercials and um, famous products and, and just things that were popular around. If we were doing it today, there would be art of, of um, like reality stars and, and you know, just ads and um, things that look like some of the social media pages. So he used what was very popular and what was in the culture, TV programs. Um, he, you, you'll see he's got pictures of some of the art he did was of, of characters from TVs and movies and things. But the whole idea of pop art was to do these things that were popular and that people would recognize, but also in a way, it was saying, making a comment about fine art you know, that, that hung in the museums, because in the beginning, a lot of their stuff did not hang in museums, but other things did. And in some ways, they were what was popular in their times, a lot of it, or, or challenging the ideas of what art looked like in their times. Well, he was challenging the idea of what art looked like in, uh, in you know, his time. 
So he was a pop artist. We're going to look at one other pop artist. Um, they're pretty cool. Uh, so we'll look at it in a couple of weeks. We have another one. So let's get on to our book. Um, the book is called Fabulous, which is absolutely a word that he would have used to describe himself. Uh, it's a portrait of Andy Warhol. It's done a little different. It's not a, like a follow-through biography. It kind of looks at little incidents in his life, it's just little pieces of, of his life. And it's by uh, Bonnie Christensen, and it's published by Henry Holt and Company. So let me get that ready for you. Okay, here we go. Fabulous. A Portrait of Andy Warhol by Bonnie Christensen. She did both the, uh, the art and the writing. And here's his first kind of fam most famous work of art right there on the page. And here he is himself. Um, quote at the beginning. They always say that times change things, but actually you have to change them yourself. Andy Warhol. New York City, 1966. Wow, see that guy with the wild silver wig and the white, white skin? An actress on one side, a rock star on the other? Oh, Andy, do my portrait, they beg. Andy sighs, sometimes says yes, no, or I don't know. He never says much, though. He mostly watches and listens. Everyone wants to get close to Andy Warhol, prince of pop, king of cool. Photographers line up outside waiting. The night streets of New York's glitter with headlights, street lights, and flash bulbs. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1930s. The streets of New York were a world away from the hillside alleys where Andy grew up, where his immigrant parents and two brothers worked hard just to get by. The whole family lived in just two rooms, no indoor toilet, and only one bed for three boys. Andy was the baby, small, smart, shy. On his first day at school, a girl hit him. Andy cried and refused to go back. At home, he and his mother drew pictures of each other and the family cat. That's something else associated with Andy Warhol is cats. He had lots of cats. Two years later, at six, Andy started a new school. His teachers liked him and recognized his talent for drawing. Andy drew constantly. When he was supposed to be covering outfield during a baseball game, his brothers found him drawing flowers and butterflies in the front yard. Illness, third grade. Movie magazines, a Charlie McCarthy doll, Dick Tracy comics, paper dolls, and a cap gun. All these things covered Andy's bed during his months of illness. So a couple of things in there. Charlie McCarthy was a ventriloquist dummy who was on the radio, <laughs> which was kind of funny. Uh, Dick Tracy, um, in fact, here, there's Dick Tracy right there. He was um, uh, a comic strip in the newspaper, and it looks like, it looks like he had a, like a set of those. Um, here, here, his illness, St. Vitus, Vitus's Dance, caused muscle spasms and permanently blotchy skin. Andy listened to the radio. His mother read to him. His brother helped him write fan letters to movie stars. Shirley Temple signed, sent him a signed photo. In fact, here's Shirley Temple right up here. She was a very, very popular actress. She was a little girl and sang and danced and was very charming and was one of the most popular of all the movie stars of the day. While he was sick, Andy's bed was in the middle of the dining room. Glamorous celebrities and superheroes kept him company. Day after day, Andy drew, watched everything around him, and drew some more. His mother gave him a chocolate bar whenever he finished a drawing. Why should he ever go back to school? Art. But with a pale, red blotch face, Andy did go back to school because he was well enough. Kids called him Spot. People said he was a sissy because he spent so much time with his mother and refused to catch a football. He drew through all of it. Andrew drew, drew during free art classes at the Carnegie Museum. Everything you observe has art or the lack of art, his teacher said. Andrew drew portraits of cousins, portraits of neighbors. He gazed his icon portraits in the church. 
rows and rows of portraits. The form intrigued him. In fact, if you look at these, when we, when we take a look, you've seen some of his work, how he likes to have those, like the, the soup cans. They're all in the kind of shape box, all just a little different. He did a lot of that. High school years. Andy was 13 when his father died. The family mourned, walking to school through the Czech ghetto. Andy felt left out and alone, marked by his blotchy skin, his red and bumpy nose. Everyone, even the family, called him Andy the Red Nose Warhala. And Warhala was his um, original last name. He changed it when he became famous to just Warhol. Andy kept his head down, filling whole notebooks with drawings. College. In college, Andy studied art and invented his own drawing style. He also learned that paintings aren't just decorations. Paintings can make people mad, can make them ask questions, makes them see things differently. Why pick on me? Andy's painting of a boy picking his nose did all those things and was rejected from a major art exhibit. Andy put the painting in another show and people flocked to see it because of the controversy. New York City, 1949. Just out of art school, Andy Warhol boarded a night train in Pittsburgh. He carried his portfolio of drawings and $200. You'll do something great, crazy, terrific, his mother predicted. As the train chugged through the night, Pittsburgh became a tiny spot on the horizon, then quickly disappeared. Penn Station, the conductor called out, New York City. Andy Warhol was off and running. Within a week, he had his first job, illustrating a magazine story titled, Success is a Job in New York. After that, his work never stopped. The Cockroach Period. But success didn't equal fame and fortune. Andy shared a series of shabby apartments with a lot of people, as well as cockroaches. He still felt lonely and didn't have a close friend. Nights he spent drawing, Days he spent looking for work, dressed like a co sloppy college student. Raggedy Andy, they called him. Now, Raggedy Andy um, was, a, was a character. It, there were two dolls. It was Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy, and they had um, like bright red yarn hair. And, but uh, by saying Raggedy Andy, they're meaning that he's kind of shabby. But they called him. Art directors thought his drawings were electrifying. Andrew worked hard to please, doing drawing over and over to get them exactly right. At home, a home, illustration work, prestigious awards, and money began to roll in. Andy rented his own apartment and adopted a cat. His mother came for a visit and stayed forever. Andy kept on drawing even when he wasn't working. He drew pictures of shoes and food, portraits of friends and his cats, soon too many to count, all but Sam, all named Sam. Because he hated working alone, Andy convinced friends to help him paint his drawings. When he complained about going bald, his friends encouraged him to buy a wig. As time passed, the wigs got wilder and wilder. 1960, friends, success, money, attention. Andy had them all, but it wasn't enough. I want to be as famous as the Queen of England, he said. I want to be Matisse. But Andy was, Andy was a commercial artist. Matisse, a celebrated fine artist. Commercial art was everywhere. Newspapers, magazines, street corners, while fine art arts hung in twinkling white galleries. Rich and elegant beauties visited the galleries, bought fine art paintings, and adored the painters. So here's an idea that he's thinking already, that commercial art was everywhere. That's what pop art was, just takes on that, rather than that kind of fine art that hung in the galleries. Andy looked around. Some fine art galleries were suddenly showing everyday objects, just like commercial art. He'd been training for 10 years. Why couldn't he do that? So he set up a studio and started big paintings. Dick Tracy pieces, ads for wigs, TV, cans of food, Coke bottles. Some galleries seems interested, but nothing came of it. Andy worried, what should I paint, he asked a friend. Paint something so familiar that no one even notices, she said. Something like a Campbell's soup can. Campbell's 
Campbell's Soups Cans. Good advice, Andy made 32 paintings, one for each kind of Campbell's Soup. A fine art gallery in Los Angeles showed them all lined up side by side. They caused a sensation. Andy was on his way as a fine artist. Next, Andy painted portraits of movie stars, then photos from newspapers. He painted portraits of people, objects, and events that defined the time. The factory. If one is good, 50 is better. Andy learned to reproduce his paintings quickly. He could make rows and rows of Coca-Cola bottles or portraits. Andy called his studio the factory because he and his assistants quickly manufactured paintings using commercial printing process. Friends and strangers stopped by all the time. Andy was always working, never alone. Then he bought a movie camera. Andy's first films were simply about watching. Sleep featured a man sleeping for six hours. Empire showed the Empire State Building for eight hours. More shock, more films, more fame. Andy was soon as famous as the movie stars he painted. Famous in New York and Paris where crowds lined up to see his paintings in glittering fine art galleries. Famous in Rome, Italy, where he met with the Pope. Famous in Philadelphia, where 4,000 people mobbed the opening of his first museum show. Spot, the poor, sick, and shy kid from Pittsburgh, had transformed himself into the prince of pop art, art that anyone could recognize and understand. New York City, 1966. Oh no, is he going? Heads turned as Andy leaves the restaurant. Most everyone watches him. Autograph, someone asks, holding out a napkin to be signed. Sure, yeah, Andy sighs. He's nice and friendly in a quiet way. He smiles. Outside, photographers stop him to ask, hey Andy, what's next? Andy pauses, looking a bit confused. Everyone waits. After a minute, he puts his hand on his mouth and tilts his head to the side. I don't know, Andy says softly. What do you think? No one answers. Flash bulbs flash, Andy smiles again, a tiny smile, and slips away along the glittering night street. Fabulous, he whispers to himself. Fabulous. And there's just a little note here in the back that I like. It says, to most people, his name conjures up Campbell's soup cans, which is exactly what I thought, and a pale man wearing an outrageous wig. Some recall the phrase, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Very few people know that Andy Warhol attended church regularly, helped serve Thanksgiving dinners to the homeless, lived most of his life with his mother, and possibly suffered from dyslexia or Asperger's syndrome. Warhol truly did things his way, whether having trouble tying a necktie, he'd simply cut off the end that gave him difficulty and stuck it in a box filled with the cut off bits of ties. He also used cardboard boxes to store the ephemera, that just means all the stuff around his house he acquired on a daily basis. Newspapers, fan letters, bits and pieces of this and that. He called these boxes time capsules. He created over 600 of them. Besides his unique perspective and imagination, Andy also had a sense of humor. Once trying to find illustration work, he called a magazine and said, hello, this is Andy Warhol. I planted some bird seed in the park today. Would you like to order a bird? Then ask for a job. I wonder if he got that. In the final analysis, Warhol appeals on many levels. Warhol the artist, artist broke down barriers. Warhol the poor kid from Philadelphia was sought out by all sorts of stars. Warhol coyly stonewalling interviewers and toying with the press. He was a man of few words who was apt to seek ideas for artworks from all sources. A man who worked constantly but had an air of diffidence that could lead one to believe he never labored in a day full of contradictions, both stated and implied, fascinating and fabulous. <laughs> so that is fabulous, the portrait of Andy Warhol. Yeah, I have a few more pictures to show you. First of all, he did start out as a commercial artist. That's, you know, a commercial artist is somebody who uh, draws pictures for ads or um, for, you know, anything at all that anyone needs, any business. They, they want a logo for their um, 
you know, for their company. Now commercial work, they, now they call them, you know, graphic designers. So here's a, a few of um, things that he did. First of all, here is a picture of that very first one he did about um, success for a magazine. Doesn't really look like his style at all, does it? And this is just a composite of some of the work that he did. And then I kind of pulled up from those, I pulled out one for Macintosh uh, computers and uh, just kind of um, took the logo and added, added to it. And also Paramount Pictures. Uh, that one too is very familiar, but you know, during the time he was working for them, that's you know, what he, how he colored. So um, you know, here's just, I said that he likes uh, like things from movies. Well, here is um, a work he did using Mickey Mouse. He did a lot with Mickey Mouse. And um, here's a self-portrait that, that he did. And I think this, this next one is really beautiful. It, it's a, a portrait of Queen Elizabeth. I think that's just absolutely lovely. And um, the last one here is um, one that kind of cracks me up. You know, just the way that the pop artist felt about, you know, fine arts and, you know, versus the work they were doing and until all of a sudden the pop artists were in those museums and getting their work sold for lots and lots of money and a lot of attention. But before that, this is one that he did and it's a, a painting by, by Munch um, called The Scream, which is kind of a popular painting that he recolored. So that's just a, just a few more looks at his art. He's very interesting. He's definitely worth you know, going in, you know, reserving from the library, getting a book of his, his stuff and looking through because it's, it's interesting, very, very interesting. Okay, well, I've, I have got three different things you can do to celebrate the work of Andy Warhol. First off is um, I have put in the notes uh, at the end of this video a link that will get you your very own set of Campbell soup cans that you can color. Uh, and I like the fact that they did not put what kind of soup it is, so you can make it all kinds of things. It don't, you don't have to make it real soup, you can just make it, um, you can make it crazy stuff. Uh, you can color it either as he did, as they really look, or as the second one I showed you where he used all sorts of wild colors. So be creative, come up with your own soup. It's, um, it's that's classic Andy Warhol. That's what most people think of when they think of him. Uh, the second second one is also another, it's a link off of the, the notes below. And uh, I like the way that he recolored the screen. So uh, what it's links to is uh, a lot of pages of different artists, you know, kind of classical masterpieces. You can choose one, you can go crazy with what you want to do with it. Uh, you can color different colors, or I think that he would really have enjoyed, in some ways, doing it and putting in, like doing, uh, the picture I'll show you here is, is American Gothic. And that one is something, when I see them, I would definitely, I'd give them earbuds and, 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 and I, <laughs> you know, an iPhone, or I would do, I would add things to update it to make it more popular culture. That would be my way of going, but think of yours changing those colors, um, adding other things in the background. Just have fun with that. And the last one is the one that I did decide to do. In fact, I probably will go back and, and do the others because they sound fun. What I did is I took a picture of myself and then I fooled around with the, I made it black and white, and then um, I fooled around with um, some filters to make it just as ghostly as possible. So you can go and do that. You can desaturate it or, or take a, you know, add brightness to it. I just wanted it to be just as, just the blankest palette I could make. And then I took some colored pencils, except I wanted, I wanted pink so badly, I couldn't find a pink colored pencil, so I went to a marker. I just took and I recolored myself. And I don't look glamorous like uh, Marilyn Monroe in, in these, but it was, it was fun to do. So, and his things, he tended to take only two colors on, on each of his um, pictures. So I chose for each of them, you know, here's some um, purple and green and orange and yellow, red and blue and pink and kind of a, it claimed to be fluorescent orange, but it was not very fluorescent. And then I took, and I'll show you what I did. I put them together, 
I put the four of them together and photographed them as, as one work. It's kind of horrifying, but I had a good time doing it. It was really fun. You don't have to do yourself if you want. I thought of doing my cat, but she's, um, uh, she's gray, doesn't make a very good palette. And then I thought of just taking a picture of something like a bottle of water, and, and sorry about that. Uh, my table just squeaked. Um, a bottle of water or just anything. And, um, and just making multiple, uh, you know, printing up multiple pictures and coloring them different, different colors to make an, an, uh, an homage to um, Andy Warhol. So be creative, come up with some great ideas, um, do yourself, do someone in your family, do, um, do objects, just anything at all that you'd like to try. Um, and next week, I, I, I told you wrong last week, I said that we were doing Georgia O'Keeffe this week but I um, got my schedule mixed up. <laughs> so um, we're doing Georgia O'Keeffe next week and um, one of my favorite artists. And we'll be again looking at not the big picture, but the very small picture. We'll be kind of honing in on like a uh, close-ups of, of objects. So, all right, well, thank you. And I hope to see you next week. Bye.